So I want to make sure that when we're speaking of spiritual things, that unless you have the Holy Spirit indwelling indwelled inside of you, you miss those spiritual things. And if, you, and if you've not received Jesus Christ as your Savior, Lord, we're going to take care of that too. Because I believe prophetically, that's why the Holy Spirit said, this is going to get crowded soon. But if you've received Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, that means you're indwelled with the power of the Holy Spirit. It means you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. So I just simply want you to do the third level of alpha acknowledgement. All right, I missed some of you. Like doing a slow motion. There you go. Amen. So speaking of the ultimate alpha Let's read the word of the Alpha. This is our anchor scripture, the word of the Lord that we're going to focus on today. And it's from Ephesians 1, 17, 19. And if we would stand as the body and we will read the word of the Lord as the body, and we'll read together and we'll begin that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for that word. Thank you for that word. So Paul is still establishing the significance and the identity of who God is. And what he's also doing is he's establishing sound doctrine in real time. Because back then it's like, well, all you got to do is read the Bible. Just go to Barnes and Nobles and read the Bible. Well, guess what? It hadn't, been, it hadn't been canonized. It hadn't been printed. It hadn't been distributed. So Paul is creating, laying down, sharing, establishing sound doctrine in real time. And how that benefits us is now we've got sound doctrine through the word of the Lord, but now our responsibility is instead of speaking to establish sound doctrine, it's to take the sound doctrine and speak it into life and to grow the kingdom through that, through that, um, through that sound doctrine. You know, I'll tell you, when, when we're sharing our testimonies, it's important to remember, like God's word is good enough. To me, those baseball cards, even though they had the sticky on the back, they were good enough. God's word's good enough. I was invited to a men's conference years ago, and they like my background. They like my, bi- uh, my bi- um, biography. But I get up there, and the Holy Spirit's like, mm, this ain't about you. This is about me. So I was like, hey, I said, I'm Scott, and I want to tell you about Jesus. And I went into just sharing the gospel. And the response, as you would expect, was amazing. Not because of what I've done or who I was, or like Barnes says, that stuff on the wall in your office. It's because the gold in your heart of the Holy Spirit. But I can tell you, because I didn't waste the gospel on my testimony, and some of us get caught up in that. We want to share our testimonies, and we'll go 30 minutes talking about woe is me and woe is me and and 30 minutes of this and that and glorifying the old days. And at the very end, like, oh, and glory to God. Like, that's not testimony. Be sure when you're like Paul that what you're sharing is the word of the Lord. Because God's word doesn't need entertainment to make it effective. What it needs, it needs reverence to make it matter. So sometimes when we get comfortable in the familiarity of relationships or friendships, or with our spouse or kids. Sometimes in that familiarity, we lose reverence. And that's why I believe it's important that when we do read the word of the Lord, that we understand the purpose, the principle, the price that was paid for that word. So when, when when the New Testament authors are laying down doctrine in real time, and they're suffering real consequences, and then when Jesus says, hey, y'all, I'm going to commission you to share this word. I believe it's important that we not just read the words like, oh, I remember that as a kid. My mama used to tell me those things before bed. I believe that because the Holy Spirit sealed us, like Ephesians 1 tells us, that that word is the reason for the sealing. What did Jesus tell us in Matthew 28 about that word? What did he tell us to do with that word? And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, 
teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. Like sometimes we just, we get too familiar with that. Oh, the Great Commission. The Great Commission. Where was that? Matthew, yeah. The Great Commission. Like, we got to take it serious. We got to take it serious, the word of the Lord. If, if he came back to give us the, the kingdom growth blueprint, if we don't take that word and share that word because we first lived that word and believed that word and we've received that word, then that word dies on the vine with us. We can't be so cavalier to think, well, uh, somebody else is going to tell them about it. They can look at TikTok and get a good message. I mean, my gosh, I saw somebody posted a meme the other day. Don't discount your value in the kingdom. Don't discount the power of your testimony in the kingdom. Let me tell you, when Paul goes to Ephesians 1.15 and he says, Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and the love for God's people everywhere. How did Paul hear that word? Because of testimony. Because the 411, my kids are like, they don't even so that they say don't, they don't even say that anymore. The 411. Well, I'm gonna say it because that's my generation. The 411. The word on the street is that the people in Ephesus love Jesus and they love each other. How did that word spread? Through testimony. How is this community going to be affected? Through our testimony. I want to encourage you to find the boldness. We're watching the YouTubes and the TikToks and Ashbury, and we're like, oh, I wish we had some of that revival here. You know this. That same Holy Spirit that hovered the waters, that same Holy Spirit that descended upon Jesus upon water baptism, that same Holy Spirit that sealed within you when you received Jesus Christ, and you affirmed it because you gave us the third level alpha, is the same Holy Spirit at that campus. There is revival. And it starts with you. And it starts with your testimony. Test, revival, I'm sorry, testimony is meant to encourage, to share the word and build up faith in others. So when Paul heard that testimony, it triggered a visceral response in him. It led him into taking a posture of praise and prayer. We know this because Ephesians 1.16 tells us, and he says, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly. What Paul's telling us is that we've got to pray without ceasing that we've got to speak life into life. I ask you, what words are you speaking? Well, it's just a little joke. They knew I was joking. I'm just kidding, Leah. You know, my kids will get over it. Kids are resilient. They recover. I'm asking you, what words are you speaking? When we're talking to brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm asking you guys to remember this is a collection of people. We all come from different walks. But what are we together? We're the body preparing to become the bride. Be gentle in the way we speak to one another. Be respectful in the way we speak to one another. Be encouraging in the way we speak to one another. It's so easy to get aggravated with each other in the natural. This is the bride. We've got to treat her with respect. So instead of testifying to the goodness of God, I remember that old thing in the 90s. It was that uh, WWJD. What would Jesus do? Remember? And those rubber bands and you'd wear them around your wrist, you know? And, and, and I'll be honest with you. I mean, I wore them, but, but you know, I, I was living in darkness. I mean, the only time I really looked at that band was when I was in a bar room drinking or out in the street fighting. And my concern was, well, I didn't want to break my Jesus band, <laughs> you know? But look, that ain't Jesus. But the thought's right. What would Jesus do? I'm asking you today because we're talking about your testimony and the power of prayer. Add this to it. WJST. What would Jesus, would Jesus say that? Would Jesus say that? Before we do say anything, would Jesus say that? Eunice nailed it. She talked about healing in this house. And there's healing that's going to, that is manifesting in this house. And I've had to share with several people this weekend. They're like, my cancer, my depression, my asthma, my addiction. And I'm like, well, was Jesus addicted? Did Jesus have asthma? Did Jesus have cancer? No. You were created in the image 
So you don't have it either. You've been diagnosed with asthma. You've been diagnosed with cancer. You've been diagnosed with depression. But don't say, my asthma, my cancer, my depression. Because you're now linking that to an identity that is solely based on who God is. And God doesn't have cancer. And God doesn't have asthma. And God doesn't have addictions. A fallen, decrepit world does. And when we attach those labels to ourselves, we're stepping outside the will of God. The will of God is that we remain in the image of God. So choose your words carefully. And when we pray and we're choosing those words, we've got to be like Paul. We've got to be moved by compassion when we pray for others, when we pray for ourselves. You know, there's, there's a, a confusion sometimes, and we talked about it yesterday. There's sympathy, empathy, and compassion. And sympathy is, I see you in a hole, in a deep hole, and I'm like, aw, but I keep going. <laughs> empathy is, I see you in a deep hole, I'm like, aw, and I jump down in that hole with you. And now guess what? We're both stuck in a hole. <laughs> compassion sees you in that hole, feels and takes a ladder and puts it in that hole and says, now get out. Compassion is compelled to action, which is what moved Christ to heal, which is what moved Paul to prayer. Look, it's easy to get wrapped up in our emotions, which is the soul. Oh, you want to grandma somebody, you want to pat their little poo-poo diaper. That's comforting, but you don't affect any change. You want to affect change? Move in the spirit. Move in the Spirit, be compelled with compassion, which is compelled to action. Scripture, scripture is that ladder that will get you out of that hole. Amen. So we're talking about prayer, power prayer. Paul in Ephesians 1, 17 through 19, he lays down a powerful prayer. And I want to read it to you. It was our anchor scripture. That the, Lord of, uh, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Like emotionally, your body, your ears, your, your soul might be like, that's cool, that's cool. But when you allow it to speak to your spirit and you realize the reality of what Paul's praying you see, you're not just going to figure out the goodness of God, the sovereignty of God, the eternity of God. You're not just going to figure it out unless you've got the Holy Spirit to explain this to you. I want to ask you, do you pray dangerously? Do you really pray? Now, I'm not talking about praying when things are dangerous. I'm talking to you pray dangerously. Like, or most of us like, Jesus, I hope I have a good day. Lord, I hope I get a 10% discount on the meal because it was late. Jesus, I pray that we have a safe drive to the restaurant after church. Like, is that the depth, the extent of your dangerous prayer life? Have you ever prayed God to reveal to something to you that's got to be cast out? Reveal something inside of me, God, that's keeping me from relationship with you. I'm going to tell you the most dangerous prayer we ever prayed was I, we prayed for God. We said, God, whatever, whenever, wherever, we will follow. And I prayed, and we were, we were so religious in that prayer. And then it got real. And then I stopped praying that prayer because I got scared. And one day I'm in a worship session, and the Holy Spirit says, Son, why don't you stop praying that prayer? And I'm crying and I'm crying and my beard's saturated with hot tears. And I said, oh, because I'm scared. I'm scared. I like our house. I love where we live. We've worked hard for that house. What if we got to move? And the Holy Spirit says, son, I need you to pray that prayer again. And I came home and I repented to Leah. I said, I want to, I'll repent because I, I'm scared to pray dangerously. I'm scared to trust God with everything, including where we live. I repented to my wife, and we started praying that prayer again. God, whatever, whenever, wherever, we will follow. Amen. What I didn't know was he was planting that seed in my soul and my heart so that my spirit would be ready to move where he led us, which was four miles to this building from our house. We were willing to move across the globe. And God said, no, nah, we'll start here. Are you praying dangerously? 
Are you afraid what God might tell you to do? Are you afraid what your words might activate? I'm telling you guys, God is on the move like we've never known, ever known in, in our lifetimes. And people say, well, are we in the end times? Yes. Yes. Every second we live, we are one second closer to the end time. And your prayers have got to get dangerous. They've got to get effective. They've got to become effectual. They've got to become like Paul's prayer. You've got to stop praying for just you and your comfort. You've got to start praying and asking God, reveal to me where I need to be, where I need to go, what I need to say. I love when, when, when April talks about uh, how to do life with God and how to hear from God. And it shakes people up because they realize, oh, that's how you do it. And one day it was like, and, and I use her example, is that every day you get 30,000 opportunities to make decisions. It's do I look this way or that way? Do I wear this shirt or that way? Do I eat this or do I not eat that? 30,000 opportunities to make decisions every day. That's 30,000 opportunities to connect with the Holy Spirit. And you're like, well, what does the Holy Spirit care what color shirt I wear? You know what? He probably doesn't, but he cares that you communicate. He cares. When Lee and I get up in the morning, I'm like, hey, what you got going on today? What she's going to do is what she's going to do. It's already been set in motion, but she knows that I care by asking her, hey, what you doing today? Hey, how are you feeling? Take those opportunities to connect with the Holy Spirit. Then you'll hear the Holy Spirit when you start to pray dangerously. Then you'll move beyond being complacent. I hope we have a good day today, Jesus. Every day in Jesus is a good day. You know, when Paul, when Paul prays in Ephesians 1, 19, 20, he says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Do you know why Paul did not pray for God to give them power? They had it. They had it. If you've received the Holy Spirit as your Savior and Lord, you know what you got? You got that same power. So we're not going to pray if you've received Jesus. We're not going to pray that you receive power. You've got power. Ephesians 1 tells us you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. So that power is not going to leak out like a bad radiator. You're sealed. My prayer, our prayer, is that you understand the power you have, that you use the power you have, that you walk in boldness in the power that you have, that we stop being so timid about offending people with the word of the Lord, that we contain the power that we have. God's good. God's good. And, and, we're, and we're talking about Paul's dangerous prayers. And, and if you want to learn to pray dangerously, in two weeks, our teacher, Byron, he's wrapping up a series on faith. And then we're going we're gonna to take off March the 9th. Uh, and then we're going to start back after that. And he's going to do a six-week series on prayer. Listen, if you want to transform your life, be here on Thursday nights at 7 o'clock for Design for Discipleship as our five-fold teacher, uh, Byron Hamilton, leads us uh, through what it is to pray. You know, God's good. God's Word is good. Y'all, God doesn't need lights and smoke machines and fog machines and LED machines. He doesn't need high praise performers and, and high profile pastors to share the word of the Lord. The beauty of that Ashbury revival is that it's in a simple structure. They can't even adjust the lights. They can't even dim the lights. There's no fog. There's no smoke. The building's so old that the fire marshal would have a fit if you lit any kind of pyrotechnics. You know what it is? It is the word of God being shared. Let me trust you. I talk to a lot of men, and they're like, well, are you witnessing? I'm not really sure what to say. I don't know this. You don't have to know what to say. You don't have to have fancy words and a, and a high degree on your wall. You don't have to have funny stories and good jokes. You don't even have to have a baseball bat. All you got to do is share God's word. God's word is good enough. God's word is good enough. I am.